All right, what's up, Summit Park? How are we doing, everybody? It's so good to see you, everybody. And uh, I want to take a minute before we jump into our content today. And I want to welcome everybody who is watching online via the internet. And of course, everybody who's over at our South Side, South Campus. Come on, North Campus. Can we give it up for everybody who's watching online? Give it up for them. Make them feel welcome. And I hope all of you all feel welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today. Uh, man, this is, this is one of the uh, most exciting times of the year because it is the most wonderful time of the year because, everybody, it's Christmas time. Are you ready? Uh, here it comes. Get ready. The holidays are here. And uh, one of the things as a church that we want to do for you is we want to give you opportunities to grow your faith. We want to give you opportunities to celebrate Christmas. And we also want to give you opportunities to help uh, be the light of God to uh, our community all around us. And so you're going to be hearing more about uh, some of the different activities we had. We talked about Christmas Adventure during video announcements. It's going to be incredible. We're going to have an Advent, a uh, little uh, devotional thing that we're going to make available for you and your family to go through the Christmas season so you guys can grow together as a family, grow together as, uh, as followers of God and celebrating Christmas. It's going to be something I think is going to be super meaningful for you. And then, of course, our Christmas services at the end of December, they are going to be fire. Everybody say fire. Turn to someone and say, it's going to be fire. It's going to be fire. Some of you are like, no, I'm not doing that. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be really, really good. Man, the music is going to be so good. The story is going to be so good. It's all going to be so good. I promise you. Uh, be praying about who you could invite already. Just start praying about it. And uh, we're going to have an awesome, awesome time at Christmas. It is the most wonderful season of the year. If you believe it, say, I do. All right, let's, uh, I want to jump into our, our content today. We're talking about God encounters. We're in week two of a series called God Encounters. And the whole idea for this series is that life is all about a series of moments. So really, when you think about life, and when you get to the end of your life, you're going to look back and you're going to look at your life, and it's going to be a series of moments. And the things that you'll remember, the things that will be most meaningful to you, are the defining moments. And really, really what we want to have are our significant moments. We want to have good moments. And I, what the whole idea for this series is, is God wants to have a moment with you where he changes everything about you. Like, like the living God, the one who spoke the world into existence, wants to have an encounter with you. This is pretty amazing when you think about it, that, that God, living God, wants to meet with you, like you're on his agenda, like you're important enough to him to want to have a meeting with you. That's what this whole uh, series is all about, moments, moments that matter. And now, if you're new to church or if you're new to following God or maybe you're not following God, all of this starts when you make a decision to trust God. Uh, the Bible calls this salvation. It calls it being born again. It calls it uh, being saved. There's this moment where we stop trusting ourselves and we start trusting God to be the center of our life. And man, it's like literally everything changes. It's like you're seeing in black and white in one moment and the next moment you're like, okay, I get this thing. Like I get what this whole thing's about. It's, it's, it's life and technicolor. That's, that's, what, that's what experiencing Jesus is all about. But what we're talking about in this series is that God doesn't want to be one and done in our lives. What God is looking for is this ongoing relationship with us where you and I look to him and we put our trust in him and all of a sudden like he, 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 he has encounters with us all throughout our life. It, literally every day God wants to have an encounter with you. He wants to speak fresh vision into your life, fresh passion into your life. In fact, Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and verse 18 says this, be filled with the Spirit. Now, what that means is like, okay, have, open yourself up to God and say, God, I want all that you have for me. You be filled with the Spirit. But literally, it's translated be, being filled. So it's like this ongoing thing that's never done. It's always happening. It's God speaking vision and passion and grace and hope to our lives. And it's the best thing 
in the world. So what we're doing in this series, we're saying, hey, okay, if that's true, if God wants to do that, then I want all that he has for us. We're looking at encounters that people had with God in the Bible and then walking away saying, all right, now what can an encounter uh, in my life look like? And today I want to talk about one of, I think, the most crucial and I think one of the most and it's actually beneficial benefits that we can experience that when we have an encounter with God, we're going to walk away from, and it has everything to do with peace. It, God wants to give us peace. And as a testimony of humanity at both campuses, can we just take a moment? How many of you have been stressed in the last month? You've been stressed, anxious, you've been worried. All right, so look at this. All right, everybody stressed out, put your hands down. How many in the last, like the last week, you've been stressed? Just raise your hand, okay, still stressed out. All right, put your hand down. How many today just getting ready for church, if we're honest? It was World War III. In the living room, diapers were flying. It was just... Not a pretty picture. We're stressed out, right? Like this is, the, and, and the thing is, we're stressed about so many things. We're stressed out about our, our past. We're stressed out about our present. And we're stressed out about our future, right? Like there's so many things to be stressed about. Like, okay, for instance, if you don't have a job, like that's a stressful moment, right? So you're stressed. You got to find a job. Okay, I got to find. And then if you have a job, how I many you know you're stressed? You're freaking out because you got to hit your numbers. You got to you got to get the details. You got the boss is crazy. You know you you got all of those things. If you're single, you're freaking out, right? Like you're single because you're like I want to get married. Oh, I got to find a person. I'm getting older. I got to find that person. And then you get engaged and you're freaking out, like, right? It just goes from one freak out to the next. Then you get married, and you're like, still freaking out. Wow, what, what did I get myself into? I mean, what's going on? Trying to have kids, and you can't, right? That, you're freaking out. And then you get the kids that you thought you wanted and realize, I'm not so sure. <laughs> freaking out, <laughs> you know? And then the kids grow, and they leave, and it's just you, and then you're enjoying life. Empty nesters. <laughs> We just, we just envy all of you. No, there's still things to stress out about, right? Because then they move back in, and you're like, what are you doing here? You know, you're stressed out, freaking out. We're stressed out about all kinds of things, our families, our jobs, our finances, relationships, our government, our image, our bodies, our minds. Are we taking the right vitamins? Are we taking enough vitamins? Are we taking too many vitamins? Where have these vitamins been processed? There's so many things to be stressed out about. We're even stressed out about entertainment, right? Like, have you ever, like, had an interaction with someone at work and like, oh, hey, did, you, did you watch the latest episode of this? And you're like, no, but I, I, I promise I, I will tonight. You know, you're, like, feeling stressed. I got to keep up with this whole thing. We're even stressed about social media, like, do I, do I have a social media account? Do I not? Do I, do I post? Do I post too much? Do I post enough? Do I share enough? Does anybody like that post? Does anybody like me? You know, there's all of these things to be stressed out about. We're even stressed out about the Chiefs and the infamous decision to play or not to play Patrick Mahomes at both campuses. How many of you would say it's the right decision to let him play? Come on, raise your hand. All right. How many of you think, man, no, we should wait another couple weeks? Raise your hand. How many are like, I've got way too many things to be stressed out about. I don't even care about that. Just raise your hand. <laughs> We're stressed. I got stressed just working myself up in this moment, just thinking about all of it. And that's just normal life, right? Then you have the holidays. That's a whole other thing, right? That's a whole other animal. It's, it's, a, it's supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year, but how many of you know it can be the most stressful time of the year as well? You've got the parties, the shopping, the baking, the cleaning, the entertaining, talking with family you, you don't really know, talking with family you wish you didn't know. How do you know that uncle's going to be at Thanksgiving and there's no escaping him? There's no escaping him. And then you got to schedule who you're going to see, when you're going to see them. Okay, we're going to spend 2.5 hours with this family. <laughs> then we're going to go over here. We're going to spend 2.4. Like, everybody's getting their fair time. Scheduling air traffic control sometimes has an easier job, you know? Like, I, it's just crazy when you think about the holidays. In fact, it's a widespread problem. According to the poll by American Psychological Association, nearly 25% of Americans reported feeling extremely stressed 
come holiday time. Other holiday stress statistics show this, that 69% of people are stressed by feeling like they don't have enough time. 69% as well are also stressed about perceiving a lack of money. They don't have enough money to get through the holidays. 51% are stressed out about the pressure to give or get gifts. And it's left us so stressed out that this is crazy. 45% of Americans would rather prefer to skip Christmas all together. Everybody say, bah humbug. <laughs> Some of you weren't stressed until you came to church today. And then I give you all of those reasons to be stressed. And you're like, thanks a lot. I'm so glad I came. Well, what do we do? What do we do? Like, you're getting ready to go in the holidays. So what do you do? You can't buy peace. Doesn't matter how much money you have. You can't buy it. You can try to medicate or numb it, but that's not going to work. You can be like Frank Costanza from Seinfeld, and you can scream, serenity now, serenity now, and that's not going to work. Like, what's, what's going to happen? We need a better answer. And I want to encourage you today because I really believe this. The good news is that God is a God of peace, and he wants to give you peace, a real peace, a peace that lasts, a peace that the Bible says passes understanding. It's a peace that is so good, so sweet, so powerful, so significant that, that as you're going through a difficult season, it won't even make sense that you could have it. That's what God gives. And in fact, I really think it's one of the most immediate and one of the most powerful byproducts of spending time with God. It's peace. It's peace. God wants to give peace. Anytime an angel shows up in the Bible, he says, don't be afraid. He gives peace. Jesus, right before he goes to the cross, he gets his disciples together. He huddles them up for this pre-cross devotional. And he says in, in John 20, uh, 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And I don't give you as the world gives. So don't let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Peace is what God gives, and he has it in unlimited supplies. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Paul the Apostle talks about in Galatians chapter 5. He says the fruit of the Spirit is peace. So it's one of the things that will happen in your life automatically when God is working in your life. And this is why I think the, the best days of the church are ahead of us. Because if we can really tap into this, if we can really experience this, man, the world is thirsty for real peace. We're all thirsty for real peace. And the good news is we've got the corner on the market because God is the giver of real lasting peace. And so what I want to do, I want to look at one of the most famous encounters of peace in the Bible. It's Mark chapter 4. If you have your Bibles you can, you can open up your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, you can actually download the Bible app on your phone, and uh, you can follow along there. We'll also have the verses on the screen. Uh, but, but I want to encourage you to take notes because the stuff that we're going to be talking about, I think, is going to encourage you. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 4. We're going to be talking about a storm, a storm that the disciples experience with Jesus and how he brings calm to the storm. He literally speaks peace to a storm, a literal storm, and there obviously there's some, um, there's some applications that we can make when we go through the storms of life. So if you're uh, ready to jump in and if you're ready for some more peace, see, I am. All right, let's do this. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. That day when evening came, he, being Jesus, said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side, and then they got into a boat, and they started to head that way. Now, I just want to pause for a moment, because I want to encourage you that they're about to go into a storm. We know this because I just told you that they're going to go into a storm, right? So we, we know they're going into a storm. They don't know they're going into a storm, but Jesus says, hey, let's go on a little boat ride. And here's the thing. Even though Jesus is with them, even though they're following God, even though they're making him the priority of their life, they're, they're trying to do what they know they're supposed to do, they still go through a storm. And I want to encourage you because even when you're following God, even when you're, you're trying to do your best to, to pray, you're trying to do your best to experience and give and be a part, even when you're doing everything you know you need to do, you're still going to go through a moment that's difficult. 
And it's not because God has left you. It's not because God doesn't love you. It's just a fact of life. God can still be with you when you're going through a storm. And he is right there. Look, in verse 36, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. And then a furious squall came up. Everybody say furious. Furious squall. I don't use that word very often, squall, but that's like a storm language. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. I don't know if you've ever been out, out on open water before and a storm comes in, but it can be terrifying because you don't know how bad this storm is going to be. And if you're, the waves start getting high, the boat starts tipping and capsizing, water's coming overboard, it can be a really scary thing. And this happened all the time on the Sea of Galilee where they happen to be. The Sea of Galilee is in between a couple of mountain ranges. And so what would happen, and it's a shallow lake, fairly shallow. So it has a, a warm temperature and cold air from over uh, the mountains would come down. And it would interact with these with this water, and all of a sudden, storms would come up out of nowhere. It could be, it could be peaceful, it could be calm, and all, in 15 minutes, it could be thunderstorm and waves, 14, 15 foot waves. And isn't that how life can be sometimes? Like, isn't that how life is? You get everything just the way you want it. You get the kids, they're all straightened out for about five minutes, and then you get the spouse all straightened out, you got your job straightened out, and you're like, Everything's great, and then out of nowhere, a furious squall comes on. You think everything's going good, and a storm shows its ugly head. But you don't have to worry, because if you're a follower of God, if you've made Jesus the center of your life, you've got God with you in your boat. That's what the disciples had. They've got God with them in their boat. But watch what Jesus is doing. It's almost comical. Look at this, verse 38. Jesus was in the stern. What was he doing? Sleeping. He's sleeping on a cushion. Now, this is crazy. The storm, the, the water, I mean, every, the water's coming in. The disciples are trying to bail water out. And Jesus is sitting there straight up chilling in the back of the boat. All right, let me show you a picture of what this boat like probably looked like. All right, this is just a little model of it. But it's only 27 feet long. It's seven and a half feet wide at its widest point. And Jesus is right there at that back. Like he's probably in that little cubby. His legs maybe sticking out. Maybe he's all the way in there. He's just hanging out. Now, I don't know if he was actually sleeping or if he was just kind of doing this thing, just testing to see what the disciples were doing. But here's what's interesting. He's not worried at all. They're running around. They're jumping all over. They're throwing water. They're like, ah, they're freaking out. They think they're going down. But Jesus isn't phased by the storm. Do you know why? Because Jesus is never phased by the storm. Because the God who made heaven and earth, the very God who spoke the world into existence, is in their boat in bodily form, and he's not worried about storms because he can always do something about the storms. In one moment, he can bring a calm, and that's exactly what he's going to do. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care? So they, they probably went to the back of the boat, and they're tugging on his leg. Hey, I know that cushion looks really great, but I just wanted to let you know, we're going down. They're freaking out. They're probably being, you know, just, I love how honest and real this is. They're whining. You know, like, teacher, I know you're going to be fine because you're Jesus. <laughs> but I just want to let you know, we're drowning. <laughs> FYI, memo, <laughs> do you care? Have you ever felt like, God, do you care? Have you felt like, I'm trying to serve God? I'm trying to do the right thing. Where are you? He's right in their boat. But they're freaking out. Now watch what happens. Verse 39. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down. And it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And then, what's interesting, they were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. 
See, this is the type of calm that God wants to bring to us in the midst of our storms. It's a calm that everybody's going to be like, only God could do that. O only the maker of heaven and earth could bring that about. So here's what I want to do. I, wanna, I just want to give you a couple of takeaways for this that you can apply to your life right now. And we're going to actually, at the end of this, we're going to have a little moment of prayer. We say, God, we're going to trust you, and hopefully we're going to walk away with greater peace. We're going to have a little peace encounter uh, today at church. But before we do, turn to two people, two people and say, man, you look like you could use some peace. Just tell two people. Say, man, you look like, man, you look rough. You look like, you look like morning got the best of you. Just kidding. You all look great. All right, let's do this. Let's, let's jump in. I'm going to give you a couple peace encounters. Take some notes, all right? This is going to encourage you. You can refer back to this uh, as you have your own encounter with God this week in your devotions. But um, let, me, let me encourage you with a couple of realities of peace encounters. Number one, peace encounters happen because of storms. Peace encounters happen because of storms. Now, what I'm trying to say is, Storms are a chance for us to see God in a way that we would not see him otherwise. Some of you don't agree, and you're not happy about that point. You're not even going to write it down. You're like, no, I don't agree. But it's true. It's true. I mean, think about this for a moment. Jesus gets up from taking a nap, and he says, peace, and everything's quiet. Literally, the word quiet translated means peace. So he literally speaks peace to the storm. Have you ever tried walking out into a thunderstorm and doing this? You know, just like being like, you know, this wind's going, be like, in the name of me, stop. It gets the best of you, right? Like, you know, nothing happens. Why? Because you're not God. But he is. I can't even keep my kids from fighting, let alone a storm from storming, parents. You know what I'm saying? Like, but God can. God can do something about it. Here's this normal guy, a guy who they eat breakfast with. They're walking. He shares some, some wisdom with. They're doing life with him. And all of a sudden, he stops a storm. This is amazing because Jesus is showing them. He's showing them, I'm not just a good teacher. I'm not just another teacher. I'm not just a rabbi. I'm God. And the only way they're going to see him be God is by going through this storm. Think about this. They never have this amazing peace encounter without going through it. Now they're having the power of God on display. This is the power of God that they had heard about growing up as a, as a young boy. In Israel, they would have gone to synagogue and they heard the stories of God when the Israelites were walking out of Egypt and God separated the waters and they walked through the waters. And as after they crossed them, the Egyptians were chasing them and then all of the water swept over them. They would have heard this story, but now they're experiencing that power right in their midst. Or they would have heard the story of, of Daniel being thrown into a lion's den and, and, the, and the lion's not eating him. The power of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego getting thrown into a fiery furnace. And literally the presence of God being with them so that they would not be burned. They've heard about it, but now they're experiencing it. And the only way they can and the only way they will is by going through a storm. See, sometimes... The only way you're going to experience the power of God that you want to experience, the peace of God that you so desperately need, is by going through a storm. Think about these disciples. They're never going to pray the same way again, right? Because they're changed now. They're like, no, 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 no. I saw God do something miraculous, and I know that he can, and I believe that he will. Like, I, I, I know when I'm going through another situation. I know when I'm going through another difficulty. I don't need to stress out. I don't need to freak out. I need to just go to God because I know that God can do something about this situation. They are better on the other side of the storm than they were before. But how many know they wouldn't have chosen? Just as a, as a testimony, how many of you want God to show up in your life in a powerful way that is undeniable? Come on, just raise your hand if you think that would be cool. 
All right, you can put your hands down. How many of you want a storm that challenges you in order to experience it? We want the miracle, but we don't want the prayer request. We want the testimony, but we don't want the test. But sometimes, many times, most of the time, you're not going to experience the miracle working of peace until you're going through a storm. Here's the deal. God wants to be more. This is the whole point of this series. God wants to be more than a story in a book that was written thousands of years ago to you. He wants to be a part of your story. See, God wants you to have a personal encounter with peace to where when you're facing something, you look to him and he calms the storm in your life. All of a sudden, things become clear. The stress gets lifted. The miracle gets worked. See, peace encounters happen because of storms. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to encourage you with is when you need peace, remember that God is always working. Remember God is always working. See, the disciples, they're freaking out. The storm happens, they're like, ah, they're bailing water. They're freaking out. Why? Because they forgot that God is always working. And they forgot what Jesus had said to them. What did Jesus say? All right, just sort of throw it back up on the screen so you can remember. Jesus said, let's go over to the other side. Now, I don't believe Jesus caused the storm, but I believe he knew it was going to happen. And his whole intention the entire time was to take the disciples to where? The other side. Jesus said, we're, hey, that's where we're going. Hey, we're going there, but now they're in the midst of getting from where they were to where Jesus says they're going to be, and they're in the midst of a storm, and they forgot that Jesus says we're going over. If they would have just remembered what Jesus said, they wouldn't have been so stressed out, right? If they just remember, oh, he said we're going over. Eh, it's okay, man, just enjoy this. Some people pay money to go to an amusement park for this experience. Jesus said we're going over. Here's the deal. If Jesus is leading you and you've made him the centerpiece of your life, you can know this, that he is with you. And if Jesus said you're going over, then you are not going under. You don't have anything to worry. You don't have anything to be stressed about. Because if Jesus said, hey, listen, we're going over, then you're not going under under. He's got you. He's got this. He's with you, and he is going to bring you through. You just need to hold on to what he said to you. Yeah, come on. That's worth getting excited about. I'm fired up. Man, it's so good. That's why we have to take hold of the things that God has spoken to our hearts and hold on to them. You need to remember things like like that like God says in his word. You'd be like, man, I, I don't know what God said to me. That's why we need to be in the word of God. That's what the point of this series is. You need to have a God encounter this week where you open up the Bible and you let God speak peace to your heart through his word. You're going to remember things like Romans 8 that says God is always working for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. You're going to remember things like if God is for us and God is for us, then who can be against us? You're going to remember things like, like the book of Psalms says when it says God is good and he does good. And you grab a hold of those things and you say, even though I'm going through this storm, I'm going to hold on to what you've said to me. And that is going to root me and anchor me. And I'm going to have peace even in the midst of overwhelming difficulty. I, I think like God's word is a lot like Doppler radar. Do you ever notice like, like every newscast always talks about their Doppler storm tracker 9, 10 million? You know, it's like 9, 10 million is not even a thing. But um, you ever notice that? You ever notice how every news broadcast has the best Doppler radar? Have you ever <laughs> That's just weird to me. But anyway, so, but they talk about, you know what Doppler does? It allows you to have a zoomed out view of the storm, doesn't it? It lets you know when the storm's coming. It lets you know what, how big the storm is, and it lets you know when the storm will be over. It's basically heaven's viewpoint of the storm. And when you get into God's word, you're getting God's viewpoint of who you are and where you are. And he's going to speak hope. He's going to speak vision. He's going to speak purpose. And see, here's the deal. This is why we got to open the Bible. we got to spend some time in it. God wants to have a fresh encounter with you this week. And he wants to speak through his word. 
He wants to speak hope and vision and grace and truth. And maybe best of all, he wants to speak peace. Even as you're going through whatever you might be going through, God wants to bring peace to your heart. And he can do something about your situation. He can literally transform your situation. You say, well, boy, what if he doesn't? Well, what if he doesn't? What if the storm just keeps happening? What if the surgery doesn't work? What if we don't get the job? What if we continue to struggle? What if it never gets better? Then you know what? I think you have a greater peace encounter than even if he solved the storm for you. Because sometimes God wants to take you out of the storm. And then sometimes the greater miracle is God bringing peace to your heart even as you go through the storm. Sometimes the peace encounter isn't, isn't just the miracle. It's the fact that God is helping you as you go through it. Paul the Apostle was a great example of this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This guy heals. He wrote most of the New Testament. He's healing people left and right. He's casting demons out of people. And yet he goes through a hard time. And he's like, God, will you please help me? Watch this. First, or 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan. God didn't bring it, but the enemy did, and he always does. And he says, three times I plead with the Lord to take it away from me. Usually that works for the Apostle Paul, but not this time, not for the own thing that was a thorn in his flesh. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness, he said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says this, man, there's nothing better in life than having the power of God rest on me. And you know what? As I've gotten older and I'm kind of uh, a, bit, a little bit more experienced in this Christianity thing, I, I kind of think I'm beginning to know what he's talking about. Because even more than an immediate fix to my situation, which is so temporary, what I really want is that satisfaction and that contentment knowing that I'm right with God and that I'm exactly where he wants me to be and I'm putting my trust in him. And even if that means going through a difficult situation and that difficult situation keeping me centered on him, then that's exactly where I want to be because that's where the life is. That's where the hope is. That's where the grace is. That's where the peace is. And you know what? I'd, I'd rather have... I'd rather have that than the immediate relief of my situation. See, sometimes God is going to solve your storm for you, and sometimes he's going to give you the peace to get through it. But either way, and this is the last thing I want to encourage you to have the worship team come, is that when you need peace, I want to encourage you to go to Jesus first. I want, you to, I want to encourage you to go to Jesus first. And the, the disciples show us how to do this. You know, their faith isn't really strong. All they do is whine to Jesus, but at least they whine to Jesus, right? What do we do a lot of times? We just, we just whine to our friends. I can't believe we're going through this storm. We always go through storms. And man, where's Jesus? He's asleep. He doesn't even care. Or we go on to social media and be like, I can't believe this. This is so terrible. Blah, blah, blah. Or we try to fix it ourselves, right? I'm just going to make this happen. Storm. Start going, trying to make this, push this storm through. All the while, you got Jesus in your boat. You got Jesus in your boat. And you're running around, and you're freaking out, and you're stressing out, and you're trying to make things happen, and you're angry tweeting and texting, and you're calling everybody, complaining and whining. Jesus is right there. He's right there. That's the whole point of the series. Do you know that God is right there? He's right there. And he wants to move in your life. He wants to work in your life. He wants to help you. If you just look to him. He wants you to have an encounter with him. And he wants to have an encounter with you. And although the, the, the disciples definitely don't give us a clinic on how to, like, 
like pray the best prayers. Like this teacher, don't you care if we drown? Probably not going to make the top 10 Bible prayers, you know, of all time. You know, they're not going to win any contest. At least they go to Jesus. At least they go to Jesus. And sometimes, in fact, a lot of times, I think the best prayers are just so simple and so from the heart and so raw and being like, I don't know what to do here. Would you just do something? I just want to encourage you. Some of you, like, you think you have to impress God with your prayers. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, I beseech thee, Lord. And you know what God's looking for? Teacher, don't you care? We're drowning. I'm dying here. The kids, the finances, my marriage, my job, I'm drowning. And I need you. And he's like, yep, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for, something that's real. I love what Psalm 18, Psalms all throughout the Bible, they, they, they describe this crying out. I, in my distress, Psalm 18, I called out to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, you heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. Psalm 34, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Psalm 120 says, I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. Man, God wants to come through for you. He so does. Man, this isn't myth, this isn't fiction, this isn't just a story written down. It's the living God who created everything that we know is natural. And every time we step outside, all of that is screaming that he loves you, that he has a plan for you, and he wants to come through for you if you would just look to him. You say, God, I, what am I supposed to do with this? And he wants to bring calm, he wants to bring peace. He can change your situation. And then he can change you as you go through your situation. Either way, there is peace as you go through the storms of life. I want to pray for you today. Would you pray with me, Father? I thank